What's up everybody? You're watching Model Aviator. I'm Adam and this week we've got a tips video for you. So much of what happens in this hobby happens before we ever get the airplane to the field. In and around our shop and hangar there's maiden preparation, maintenance, storage, projects, all kinds of things that we get into before we can ever get something to the field and actually fly it. So we put together some random tips for you that have to do with your shop and hangar that have come in really handy for us. They say us time, money, and headache. Hopefully, they can do the same for you. So check them out. Over the years, I've seen a lot of different ways to keep up with the various hardware and wing bolts that you need to assemble an airplane at the field. One really good way that I've seen is to just screw the screws and put the hardware wherever it's going to go on the airplane and leave it there so it's always with the airplane. The downside of that is you have to remove all that before you can use it to put the airplane together. Then when you disassemble it, you've got to take it all back off and then put it all back. So essentially you're doing the job twice. Now that's not a big deal if you're talking a couple of wing bolts for a stick or something like that. But when it comes to this Flightline Spitfire, there's a little more to it than that. And when it comes to this Carbon Z-Cub and a lot of larger airplanes, there's a lot more to it with those. So we hang on to our plastic bags that Harper comes in with our foamies. We hang on to our servo boxes anytime we build an airplane and buy servos. And we use those to hold our hardware. If you want to mark it, the respective airplane you can use the sharpie and then some gloss clear scotch tape that keeps that sharpie from ever rubbing off and then you just put a piece of velcro on your bag or your servo box and you put it on the battery tray of the airplane that way your hardware is always right there ready to go you don't have to back these out here they are and you'll never lose track of them and with an airplane like this carbon z cub there's a lot more to it. So we keep this hardware in this servo box, and inside this servo box are the four wing bolts, two antennas, eight pins, and eight clips that it takes to put the wings and struts on this airplane. That would be a lot to take off and on two times. So you've heard the term work smart, not hard. This is the best and most efficient way that we've found to keep your hardware with your airplane and have it ready to go when you need it. If you fly RC airplanes, it doesn't matter what type you fly or how you fly it, we're all going to be in the same boat quite often, and that is preparing a new airplane for that maiden flight. And part of that pre-maiden preparation is obviously programming your transmitter. There's a little known feature in any computerized modern day transmitter, whether it's Spectrum or some other brand, that an amazing number of people don't know about, and it's trim settings. How many times have you been testing a new airplane out, and let's say you put a click of down elevator trim in it, and now the airplane is ever so slightly going down. So you put one click of up, and now it's ever so slightly going up. Well, quite often people will mistake a situation like that for a servo that's not centering. Now certainly that could be it, but quite often you're just simply in between clicks. We're going to go on our NX-8 and show you what the trim settings do and tell you how they can help you with that. On Spectrum it's pretty simple. You go down to the system setup and click on that. You're going to have to verify. Normally when you're in this menu you don't have the airplane powered up. You'll come down to trim setup and that is your trim setup menu. The numbers signify how much one click of trim actually moves the servo or corresponding control surface. And those numbers go all the way from 0, which obviously doesn't move it at all, to 10, which actually moves it quite a bit with one click of trim. Most airplanes can be trimmed at the factory default of 5. But if you have large control surfaces, and sometimes it's just an interesting situation. I've had Warbirds that didn't have a lot of throw that required that I cut that number down. So now with just about everything, I go in and on the aileron, elevator, and rudder, I start with three. I rarely have to go below three unless it's a 3D plane, something with really huge control surfaces. Then I may have to go down to two. That enables me to get a really fine tune on the trim and actually trim the airplane perfectly instead of having to settle for it almost being right. So this is a really good feature in any computer transmitter that you need to know about. It's very easy to get wholeheartedly invested in this hobby. 
the passion that you develop for it is pretty amazing and we all end up with quite a few airplanes some of us have fuller hangers than others but invariably there will be airplanes some people call them hanger queens they're the airplanes that you just don't fly as much this hanger 9 sop with camel i absolutely love this airplane it's not going anywhere but to be honest it's been almost two years since i've flown this thing things like that happen and how many times have you had something like this happen you decide you're going to fly an airplane that you haven't flown in a long time and the first thing you have to do is figure out which one of your two to the four transmitters that that thing's in then you got to figure out what batteries that you like to use in it which ones you prefer once you figure all that out, you go to the field and then you have a little incident because you forget about a flying characteristic that that particular airplane has that you just didn't remember. Well, we started doing a very simple hatch checklist on all our airplanes. Now, I never even have to look at this thing with a lot of them, but if it's a long time between flights with an airplane, it's nice to have something like this here. This lets me know DX18. I know exactly which transmitter to get that this airplane's in. 23200 4S. That's really good information because I've custom made some battery slots to put the batteries in vertical in this airplane to help balance it. And the only thing that fits is 4Cell 3200. So that's good information to have. I've got 1100 milliamp life receiver pack. That's good to know because I have a mixture of servos in all of my large balsa ARFs. Some of them have high voltage servos. I use a two cell LiPo receiver pack in those. Ones like this that have standard servos, I use a life pack so I don't burn the servos up. And then I've got three point landings. That's my flying reminder. With World War I airplanes, if you've seen videos of World War I airplanes being flown, models specifically, you know that when people wheel land these things, about half the time they end up on the top wing. So that reminds me to three point it, get that non steerable tail skid on the grass as quickly as possible, creating friction and pulling the airplane to a stop. And that way I keep from turning my pretty sop with camel over, which I really don't want to do. So as we get older, we tend to forget things. If you accumulate a lot of airplanes, even if you're younger, you just may not remember. A very simple hatch checklist can save the day, make getting the airplane ready to go to the field quick, and give you that little reminder about specific flight characteristics that you need to remember. Over the years, this hobby has gotten so much easier than it was when I started. We've got it so good today. When I started, there were no bind and flies, plug and plays, or even ARFs. <clears throat> and back then, you had to learn some reasonably advanced modeling skills because that's the only way you could get in the air. Today, you can get away with not knowing how to do very much. There are people that I read in forums say, I don't know how to do anything and I don't care. I can buy everything I need and that's that. Well, that's fine, but the inconvenience gets to some of the people that are starting out today. Things like this. How many times have you seen in a forum somebody say something like, I got my new airplane in, couldn't wait to fly it this weekend, and lo and behold, dang it, the ESC has the wrong connector on it. It has a different connector than the sales page said. So now I'm dead in the water until next weekend because I'm waiting on an adapter. Well, soldering is a very, very basic modeling skill. It's one of the most basic modeling skills, and if you are an electric pilot, it's definitely something that it would behoove you to learn to do. That Weller 40 amp soldering iron cost me about 35 bucks at Home Depot. You can get a 60 watt for about 50 bucks. So it's not very expensive. You keep connectors on hand, you keep some spare wire on hand. You can go to a local modeling field, get somebody to give you an hour's worth of instruction and then go practice. You can learn to solder from a YouTube video and then just practice at home. And in no time, you'll be pretty good at this. It's just not a hard skill. So you'll never be dead in the water again with an airplane or batteries that you get in and they don't have the connector that you use. You can change that right now. You don't have to wait. Also, electronic components. When you buy a watt meter, it's going to come naked. You're going to have to solder the connectors that you're going to use onto that. A lot of times you get into ARVs, you get into some of the more advanced airplanes. You're going to get an ESC like this castle. All the wires are naked. I've got to solder the bullet connectors as well as the connector on the ESC. So it's a really 
great skill to have. It is very basic. It will give you a lot more options. It will make the hobby a lot richer for you. So I strongly suggest if you're newer to the hobby, give some consideration to learning your way around one of these. Today in the hobby, more foam flyers than ever before are experimenting with getting into balsa planes and finding out the magic of what that's all about. And it's because a lot of companies like Horizon Hobby and Extreme Flight and a few others are making plug and play examples of quite a few of these balsa airframes. That means it's easy, easy to assemble and get in the air as a plug and play foam airplane. Well, through that, a lot of people are gaining the confidence to try out ARFs. That's just a covered balsa airframe that you have to outfit with the electronics. It's harder than a plug and play, but it's not hard. Well, with a lot of these airframes, you have to account for cooling for your ESC, your motor, and your battery. The intake on a lot of ARFs and some of these plug and play airplanes is pretty obvious, but there's a bit of inconsistency when it comes to the exit hole. Sometimes those things are cut for you at the factory, sometimes you have to do it. When you do, a lot of people think, well, I'll just use a hobby knife. Well, this is another great use for a soldering iron. Quite often what people will do is just use a hobby knife to make these holes, but sometimes when you have a curve, it's difficult not to fray the edges of the covering with a hobby knife, so we use a soldering iron. Now, this is not my good Weller soldering iron that I actually do electronic soldering with. I bought this thing at Walmart for about 10 bucks. It's kind of a no-name brand soldering iron. We just use the round tip. And you are going to trash the tip after a while of using it for this, but this is the only thing I use it for. Essentially, when you want to make a hole, you just very simply poke that soldering iron through and go around the circumference of the hole fairly slow and Boom, there you go. You have got your hole very quickly made and the convenient thing about it is the heat from the soldering iron seals the edges. What I just did looks just as sharp as the hole that was made from the factory. So that's an easy way to make a cooling hole in covering on an ARF. Something I've noticed recently that Horizon Hobby's doing with a lot of their bind and fly airplanes they're putting an extension in the bind port of the receiver so that you have something to plug a bind plug into. Now, a lot of people, I think, wonder why do they do that. It seems awfully redundant because in most of these cases, you can simply get to the receiver and just press the button on top of the receiver to put it in bind mode. But that's provided you can get to the receiver. With a lot of scale planes, foam scale planes and balsa scale planes, like our Great Plains SE5A that Heidi and I refurbished together. We'll be doing a video on this at some point soon, hopefully. But this airplane, you got flying wires. You've got the receiver deep inside the airplane underneath this wing. And when you look in the battery bay, that is a step that I skipped. So I don't have my handy dandy extension poking out into the battery bay where I can get to it and put a bind plug to rebind this airplane to the new transmitter that I'm going to be putting it in. So now I've got to take the flying wires off, take the wing off, and just simply changing transmitters with this airplane has become much harder because I didn't just do the simple step of putting an extension in my bind port and running the extension into the battery bay where it's easy to get to. All I'd have to do is do this had I remembered to do that, but I didn't. So that is a really great tip with any airplane where you're going to have to disassemble to get to the receiver. If it doesn't already have an extension, just run an extension to the battery bay so you can get to it. If you ever change transmitters or have some reason to rebind that airplane, it's going to be easy. I was talking to a buddy the other day about doing this tips video and he asked me, if I had to name one tool that has made my life easier over the years in the shop and in the hangar more than any other tool, what would it be? Without hesitation, cordless drill. Now, I've had this thing about 10 years. For a couple of years before that, I had the corded version. Listen, there's nothing wrong with a rotary tool that's not a Dremel or a rotary tool, or even a Dremel that has the cord. They work great, but what I've found since I got this for Christmas, my brother actually bought this thing for me about 10 years ago, is 
it's light, it's easy to yield, it's easy to use, and not having to worry about that cord has made it possible for me to slip the back of this thing into airplanes and work up at the front, like inside the bay of the airplane. And just not having the weight of the cord pulling at you makes it a lot more precise. So it's a little bit more expensive, but the fact that this battery's lasted 10 years, still holds a charge, and I can charge it up to full and work with this thing for an entire build or an entire modification or something that I'm doing with an airplane, it has made my life easy. When you buy it, it's gonna come with this. You'll have a few things in there. You'll have a cutting disc, you'll have a large sanding disc, and you will have a grinding bit. It's actually not a drill bit for drilling a hole, it's for grinding things. You add a small sanding disc to that, and with those four things, you can do most of the things that you're ever gonna have to do. Now, they make much nicer kits that have a lot of different things in there. That's always handy, but you certainly don't have to have that. You can file things, you can use a saw, you can use an X-Acto knife, but let me tell you, when you have a job to do with a foam or a balsa airplane, quite often you will find ways for this thing to make your life easy. So if I had to say one really nice tool everybody needs to have in their shop in this hobby, this would be it. Something that's important to a lot of us in the hobby is keeping the finish on our airplanes looking good as long as possible. Some of us put a lot of time in airplanes, redoing them, painting them, and fading is something that is a real problem. Foam, especially unpainted foam, will yellow over time. A lot of times the paint on a foam airplane or the colors on a covered airplane will fade over time and one way that you can kind of prevent that from happening or at least put it at bay for a lot more years depends on the lighting that you use in your hangar. Now obviously having these things in direct sunlight is bad so we keep the window in our hangar shut all the time. There's blinds there so natural light can't get in. Fluorescent lights bad. Incandescent lights are bad. LED lights however prevent things from fading. It will take a lot more years for things to fade, not just your covering, your foam, and your painted foam airplanes, but even the colored pictures in your hangar will last longer and look vibrant longer. So if there's any way you can change the lighting where you keep your airplanes, your hangar, your shop, wherever you work on them, to LED lighting, that's going to be a big plus for you, and it's going to keep your airplanes looking good for a lot longer. Got a bit of a tip for you when you're getting an airplane, particularly a foamy, ready for the maiden flight. Quite often you have antennas from the receiver that you have to sort out. Now with this particular airplane, this is the Beach uh, D18 from E-Flight. It has two antenna tubes, but the antenna tubes are parallel to each other. So essentially both antennas would be pointing essentially in the same direction you want them perpendicular to each other. So I'm going to do something a little bit different. And also, this tube, I could use one of these, but that tube is about a quarter of an inch away from a carbon fiber beam for reinforcement right there. And I don't want to get my antenna too close to something conductive like that. So ideally, with our horizontal antenna, I want to be about right there. Now, you could just tape it down, but I like to do something a little bit different. I'm kind of marking with my eye where that's going to go. I'm going to take my X-Acto knife and cut a slot, curve it around right here. And I've just cut a little slot in the foam, and now I'm going to take that antenna I'm going to take a large flathead screwdriver and very carefully embed the antenna in my slot in the foam. I want to be careful, especially with the exposed part of the antenna. That's the important part. And now you can see I've got my antenna completely buried in the foam so it's not going anywhere it's secure it is not going to be in the way of the hatch that sits right down on it 
and I can just take some clear scotch tape just for good measure lay it across there and I'm done I'm gonna do the same thing with this one <clears throat> essentially right here and that will handle the vertical antenna so I've got dual diversity I'm gonna make sure that I tie this antenna into this servo wire so that the antenna stays clear of this arm and that's it it's just a really good way to orient your antennas embed them in the foam you never have to worry about them moving or coming loose okay we've got another little trick this is a tiny plane it's a durafly me 163 and you'll notice here i've got some wires kind of loose wires the battery tray essentially you put the batteries right here and those wires oftentimes get in the way so we got a really creative easy way of making a wire loom with just a regular zip tie so i'm going to wrap the zip tie around these wires and and make sure i get everything lined up now i want to make sure that i'm kind of lined up with this thick part of the foam right here. I'm going to go ahead and pull that tight. So now I've just got the zip tie. Now I'm going to take my wire cutters and I'm going to actually cut it at an angle like so. And you see what we're left with. Now I'm just going to take that and just press it into the foam. Use the little point like so and now I can pull this out put just a touch of medium CA right on that put it right back in my little ready-made slot and I'm done. I've got a wire loom that's not going anywhere doesn't get any cheaper or easier than that. The final thing we want to share with you is how we store lipos. Now there are a lot of theories on this. A lot of people think it isn't a big deal. We're aware that most lipo fires start, the vast majority of lipo fires start either during charging or discharging. So it's in, in the airplane or hooked up to the charger and maybe an improper setting issue almost always. However, we're human. And there have been people that have put lipos away for storage in a bad state. And they have caught on fire, burned airplane trailers up, burned houses down. It has happened. Now, typically, when it does, people will tell you, oh, I don't know what happened. It, everything was fine. I just put it away. It just spontaneously combusted. I don't believe that for a minute. I believe there was an issue with the lipo that either they didn't know about or they forgot about. They made a careless mistake because... We're human and we do that and they burn their house down so we use century fireproof safes to store our lipos it is important to note that you want to get the fireproof not the waterproof the waterproof has a rubber seal so it's airtight that doesn't allow any place for the gases when a lipo burns to go the smoke and that makes this into something that will go boom. So you definitely want just the fireproof, not the waterproof. When you do that, every lipo in this box could cook off. The worst you're going to have is you're going to have to deal with whatever the smoke does to whatever room or to your home. But you're going to have a home left. You're not going to burn your house down. We're going to put a link in the description to a video from about 10 years ago where somebody tested that very thing. They filled one of these things with lipos, stuck a cardboard piece with a nail, shut it, locked it up, and every lipo in the box cooked off. The only thing that came out was smoke. They opened it up and the box was the worst for wear, but it would have saved their home. So since I saw that video, this is what I've been using. These things were about 20 bucks when I started buying them. They're about 30 to 35 now. I know that's expensive, but it's a hell of a lot cheaper than a new home. That's all I'm saying. So store them the way you want to. We like to err on the side of caution. And from all the research that we've done, this is about the best foolproof way to guarantee 
that you don't burn your house down if you make a simple mistake. So that's it for us. Hope that all this was helpful to you. Hope there was some tidbits there that you can use. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you next week with something cool with wings.